This is Teacher's Corner from Stenhouse Publishers. I'm Nate Butler. Seemingly overnight, our education system transitioned from face-to-face to online learning, and teachers have been asked to adapt to a mode that they may not be comfortable with or have the necessary training and support to thrive in this new environment. Today's guests are educators Diana Neeby and Jen Roberts, whose book Power Up, Making the Shift to -to One-to-One Teaching and Learning, examines how personalized technology enables communication and differentiation and provides a framework for reshaping a traditional classroom into a student-centered, technology-rich environment. Their work here is especially relevant, so we're excited to share their thinking and advice in this conversation with Stenhouse's publisher, Dan Tobin. We've also posted Chapter 9 from Power Up at our website, and I'll leave the link in the description. Hello, I'm Dan Tobin, publisher at Stenhouse, and I'm here with Jen Roberts and Diana Neeby, the authors of Power Up, Making the Shift to -to One-to-One Teaching and Learning. Welcome, Jen and Diana. Uh, Thank you, Dan. Jen, uh, tell us a bit about your current role and your, your background. So I'm currently a ninth grade English teacher at Point Loma High School, which is a large public high school in San Diego, California. I also teach some pre-service teachers, uh, specifically around educational technology at the University of San Diego. I've been part of a one-to-one laptop program in my district since 2008, which was an early start. I was part of a pilot program on that. And I recently completed my national board certification. Um, And this week I've been spending a lot of time helping to train teachers in my district who are getting up to speed with distance learning. Great, Diana. Hi, um, I'm the director of teacher development at uh, and an English teacher at Sacred Heart Prep, which is an independent school in the Silicon Valley. Uh, like Jen, I teach master's students in educational technology. I'm at University of San Francisco, and I've had one-to-one iPads since 2011 and BYOD, Bring Your Own Device, since 2016. Um, since publishing Power Up, I completed my doctorate in education. Well, congratulations to both of you on your uh, recent accomplishments. That's exciting. Thank you. Um, Let's start with definitions. Uh, I know there are a lot of scenarios that fall under the umbrella of one-to-one. What's your working definition? Diana, let's start with you. So one-to-one signifies one computing device for every student. Um, In some schools, this means that students always have the device with them. So um, my school, for example, students take their devices home. Other schools like Jen's use the cart model where students have access to devices once they get into the classroom. Uh, In the current context of the coronavirus closures, students who are already taking devices home are likely having a much easier transition. And their schools, like mine, have long been aware of the inequities around home Wi-Fi access and have been working for a while to ensure that all students can get online. Districts that have the CART model right now are working around the clock to rapidly deploy devices and hotspots for Wi-Fi access to families. So, you know, the one-to-one um, framework in pre-corona days meant something very different than right now. I mean, we're hoping that all of our students at some point are going to be one-to-one, but how we get them there is looking really different depending on the type of model that um, schools have been using. One of the things that struck me as I reread your book, Power Up, was that there are so many examples where the one-to-one referred, seemed to refer to the relationship of a teacher and a student. There was a lot of one-to-one interaction. Uh, is it common that there's an overlap in one-to-one student and device and one-to-one teaching and learning between an individual teacher and a, a student? Uh, this is Jen. I think I got that one. Um, one-to-one is, is interesting because I've had it for so long now. It's just sort of normal. That's, that's normal to me. Um, but one of the things I realized really early on is that it made it really possible to communicate with students quietly, that they didn't have to say something out loud. They could message me or they could post a comment in their doc. And so that accelerated that opportunity for back and forth communication. Um, if you think about how much how fast email flies back and forth between adults, it becomes a little bit like that with students. Um, they're working on a document or they're working on a piece of writing. I can open that document. I can leave some comments. I can leave some feedback. The student can respond to that feedback 
and I can leave new feedback. And so that whole feedback loop is just accelerated. Um, we don't have to wait till we're together again in the classroom to have that back and forth communication either. So because of that real time back and forth communication, um, it's also possible to communicate with students more discreetly. Um, in, in Power Up, Diana and I call this uh, differentiation with dignity. If a student needs something or needs uh, some extra support, we can um, provide that support electronically, drop it into their document, give them a link to a resource, provide a sentence frame, uh, give some extra support, give some extra check-ins without anyone else ever knowing that we've been giving that student that extra attention. Um, so absolutely one-to-one -one increases teacher to student communication um, you know, to the degree the teachers or students are willing to engage with that. So even now during the coronavirus closure, I've been having a lot of back and forth communication with my students uh, through the apps and the documents that we're already using. How, Diana, in your first answer, you talked a bit about how one-to-one -one is changing in this period of the school closures and the quarantines. I wondered as I read the book about, it seemed to me that a lot of the best practices you were talking about with one-to-one -one carry over to, the, to distance learning. Uh, is that your assessment? Absolutely. I think it's just a lot harder right now. So. You know, in Power Up, we write about this idea that good teaching is good teaching, that whether we're, you know, in a physical classroom with um, textbooks and paper and pen, or we have one-to-one -one devices, communication, engagement, collaboration, differentiation, those things all matter. Those things are all the building blocks for solid teaching. And the same goes for teaching online. It doesn't matter if we change the venue. But what we're finding right now is that it's just a lot more layered and a lot more complex in the distance learning model. Um, as a lot of my colleagues are experiencing firsthand, it's just harder to engage students when you don't have the buzz of the classroom and the energy that proximity provides. You know, when we don't have that like interpersonal connection and we have to teach through a tiny little one inch um, square on Zoom, it's just really hard. So, you know, I've been reflecting a lot about what's different right now and how the pedagogies we've relied on for years still apply, but then how, how they feel a little bit different right now. Um, I'm not the first to say this for sure, but I feel like this move to online everything has a way of magnifying our challenges or our weak points and then reducing all of the things that we used to feel like really good about. Um, if we struggle with uh, organization, digital organization is way harder. Um, if we rely on that like chemistry and the, um, you know, the teacher has the pizzazz in the classroom, pizzazz seems to get really reduced through a video chat. Um, so one of the things that I've been thinking about is the way in which this like distance learning scenario actually really dilutes our best classroom lessons. Um, I, I've been thinking about it a lot like the difference between watching a live play versus watching a movie. Actors in live theater are able to build on the energy of the audience. They have the, ex, you know, if you're in the audience, you have the experience of being in the crowd with the cheering and the laughing and the crying, and it just brings everything to life. Um, I remember I went with a group of teachers to go see Hamilton when it first came to San Francisco. The drama director at our school had some incredible hookup and brought 50 of us in a group. And even though we were in the very back of the upper balcony, there was this indisputable buzz about being in the room, about being in the presence of these live performers. And that to me feels a bit like the classroom. But without the live audience, without the energy of the stage, you think about what we have in film. Films compensate by bringing the audience closer to the camera, by using film techniques and lighting and special effects to bring life and momentum to a production. You know, you think about like actors pile on makeup because they know that um, the camera is going to dilute the look. As teachers, I think we're much more accustomed to performing in live theater instead of film. And this moment for a lot of us feels like we're still performing live theater, but there's no audience. And we have to be six feet away from all the other actors. And it just feels for a lot of us like it's just falling flat. And so going back to your question about do the pedagogy still apply? Absolutely. But I think we have to compensate for the fact that everything we're doing is being diluted and everything that we're doing is being sort of um, 
minimized in a sense by distance and by the tools that we're using. So I'm thinking about like, what are the special effects that teachers can be using right now to draw students in and to hold their attention? Um, we know, for example, that authentic assessments are vital in classroom settings, but in online learning, it's so much more important to make sure that we're giving students a task that matters to them, or at the very least, a task that isn't Googleable, because there's nothing stopping them. Um, we know that communication, clear communication in the classroom is super important. In an online only environment, we have to be so much more clear because it, there's no tone and nuance. And I, I'm not able to look at a kid and be like, this kid's super confused. I need to go over it again. I don't have that to rely on. Um, I don't know. I think about basically we have to like turn the dial up on all of those pedagogies that we know are important. And um, in, in my, my role as a leader at my school, as an educational leader at my school, part of my job is supporting teachers. And right now I'm spending a lot of time popping in and out of digital classrooms, walking the digital halls of the school. And what I've noticed so far in terms of most effective, quote unquote, special effects um, is proximity, control, and choice. So with proximity, kids are clamoring for more opportunities to be close to one another, even though they can't be physically close to one another. So small groups instead of full class, breakout rooms instead of whole class Zoom, um, shorter synchronous sessions with kids in closer proximity to one another. Um, in terms of control, this is a moment when students feel so little agency over their lives. And I'm thinking in particular about students who are at those major transition points, eighth graders, seniors, especially. They feel like they took center stage and then the trap door got opened up and they fell through the pit. And if there's anything that we can do to give kids a sense of control, whether it's choice in um, timing, <laughs> whether it's choice in when things are due, or even instead of having them sit as a captive audience in a, in a Zoom room while the teacher delivers a lesson, flip that lesson, um, screencast it, let the kids be in charge of when they watch it, if they pause, if they go get a snack and come back, if they rewind and re-listen, giving them more control um, is better right now. And then the last one is giving them some choice. So in assignments, giving them choice over who their audience is or what the format or topic is going to be, or even the technology that they're using for a given project. Trying to turn the dial up on those elements, I'm finding those to be some of our most effective special effects to compensate for that um, diluting effect that technology is having on pedagogy right now. You talk about special effects and and uh, upping the ante a little bit, and I I'm looking at uh, Jen's incredible Zoom background, which looks like <laughs> she is sitting in a her own classroom. You had me fooled there at the beginning, Jen. So yeah, I, I uh, we had about 15 minutes to go to our classroom in March one day. And I made a list before I went of all the things I wanted to pick up. And at the top of the last top of the list, I definitely put take a picture. Um, and I took several pictures of what my classroom normally looks like when my students see me standing there so that I could use those as Zoom backgrounds when I meet with my students online. And they love it. They really think I'm at school initially. And they're like, no, you couldn't really be at school. So it's a lot of fun to kind of uh, to use them with that. And I get to go back to my classroom tomorrow and I'll take even more pictures because I now I've thought of other angles and other places I want to appear and other places they might see me. So, um, and it, and it's, it's, uh, I think it's important to make them sort of see that normality and remember where, where we come from. Yeah, that's great. Uh, one of the things that seems like a, a huge challenge at the moment is how quickly this shift to distance learning had to happen uh, virtually overnight. Uh, you talk in your book a lot about careful planning. Uh, these schools and teachers and parents really had no time to plan this in instruction um, for distance learning. I, I, what can you suggest as sort of, are there any quick fixes, things schools and teachers can do to get things moving in the right direction in the moment. Um, Diana, let's start with you and then we'll turn to Jen. 
And I wish there was a quick fix right now. <laughs> Things have been moving so quickly. And I know I can speak just from my own household. I've got two little kids at home and I feel like I'm doing my best work at 1130 at night trying to whisper in the dark. So, I, you know, I feel for everybody out there who's trying to just scramble to make it work. Um, I think the biggest piece of advice I have for teachers right now is that we have to be really kind and gentle with ourselves and with our students. Um, there's this quote that's going around like every social media, every time I check into social media, I feel like I see the same quote. And so I think it's like the universe is trying to just remind me of this, that we are not just working from home, that we're home during a crisis trying to get some work done. And I think the first thing that we have to remember is that like none of us actually intended to be online teachers. There are plenty of schools that planned to deliver a fully online curriculum the vast majority of us did not. And so this is just so much more stressful. It's so much more difficult. And there are so many other competing factors for our attention and our time. Um, our students are in the same boat. This is not how they wanted to be doing school. So we need to be kind and gentle with them too. And um, to that end, you know, a lot of teachers are talking about like how they're going to be able to move students to deeper learning and and I applaud that, but I think before we can even talk about Bloom's, <laughs> Bloom's taxonomy, I think we have to focus on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and in fact, this is something that I've seen trending on Twitter, which is Maslow before Bloom. Um, you know, before we can start thinking about moving kids from comprehension to application to synthesis, we have to start thinking about how we're supporting the physiological and psychological needs that, um, that schools often are in the role of supporting. So for schools and districts right now, whose first priority is ensuring that students are fed, sheltered, and safe, that is 100% the right first priority. Learning is secondary because it can't happen until those things have been taken care of. Um, it's, I just, I don't know, I've been thinking a lot about how the coronavirus closures in many ways um, forces us to be thinking about a different lens for our teaching. And to the point of being kind and gentle with ourselves, I think that perhaps a more helpful framework if we're trying to think about how we're planning our lessons right now is to actually take some cues from the trauma-informed teaching lens. Um, so looking at strategies like predictability, relationship building and connection, and actually prioritizing those above content mastery, above skill development, above how far we're going to get by the end of the by end of the school year. We're not going to get to the same place this year that we've gotten to in the past. And next year's teachers are going to have to pick up from a different place. And so I think in this moment, we're called to really prioritize different priorities than we have in the past. Um, I've been reading a lot around trauma-informed um, teaching strategies, and I've found uh, a few really great articles if folks are interested in deepening their understanding. There's an awesome uh, March 2020 article from Teaching Tolerance. Um, there's another one from KQED's MindShift that came out in April. And then actually back in October of 2019, um, Education Leadership ran a whole um, edition on this. And so you can, all three of those are available widely if you just search for trauma-informed teaching. Um, I don't know. That's where I would start is how can I prioritize connection? How can I prioritize predictability and relationship building? and then move into the nitty gritty. So maybe Jen can take us from there. Uh, so when I started to think about what curriculum I might wanna put in front of my students between now and the end of the year, I thought about the big units we were gonna do in the classroom at the end of the year and realized it wasn't worth it to try and convert those to be digital learning. They were so layered. There were so many articles and experiences and recreating all of that um, for all my students would have been overwhelming for me and overwhelming for them. And so I had an epiphany one day that it doesn't matter what the essential question is. It doesn't matter whether the unit is, has content cohesiveness or anything like that. What matters is what are the standards and skills that my students absolutely need before next year? What is my highest priority? What do I have to give them? And I went back to my standards and I went looking for what is something they need that also builds on something they already have? What is something that's gonna allow them to have choice and autonomy uh, and be able to make 
their own choices about what they want to, how they want to direct that. And I found two projects, I came up with two projects based on um, the California standards, or, or which are also based on the Common Core standards. One was to look at the way authors create suspense in the book they're already reading. So all my students have independent reading books they're supposed to be reading anyway. So write me an analysis because they, they worked on analysis right there in March and we can pick up where we left off with that and they can write that analysis and feel like, yes, this is a book I chose, this is an author I like, um, and this is a skill I can do and build on. And then the second one is around looking at the way the same subject is presented in multiple media formats. And so I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity for choice because they can choose their subject. I don't care whether they look at um, Bob Marley or Tony Hawk or a famous athlete or anyone they're interested in, but they can pick a person, famous or infamous, and research how is that person presented in print, how is that person presented in video, and write me an analysis of that. And so they still get to work on their analytical writing skills, which is the skill I really want them to make sure they have before 10th grade, especially for my students who weren't doing particularly well before we started. But hopefully the ability to choose their book and choose their subject matter will give them that, uh, that chance to make this something that they could actually do and care about. Um, so my district has adopted a no harm grading policy, so none of their grades can go down. So my, my focus is on looking at my students whose grades need to go up um, and giving them the opportunity to meet simple standards-based projects that are driven by their own choices uh, and that are focused on their own interests with a lot of support and a lot of feedback and a lot of that shorter feedback loop because we can communicate instantly. I don't have to wait for them to show up to second period tomorrow. I can comment on their docs tonight. They can work on them. I can message them uh, through our two-way messaging system and say, hey, I left you some feedback. Go look at it um, and nudge them toward proficiency uh, in a way that's just based on what I feel as their teacher that they need most. I know my students. I know their standards. I know what they're going into for 10th grade. And I just went for let's keep this as simple as possible. Two projects, work on them over several weeks. I'll give you a lot of support and feedback and we'll take it one day at a time. Excellent, that's really good advice uh, from both of you. As I put myself in the shoes of uh, a teacher making this transition to distance learning and, and especially if they don't have a lot of experience teaching with technology, I wonder about the challenge of just organizing the digital content, uh, the, the student work. Uh, are there any quick fixes for that? Any starting points you would recommend, uh, Diana? Yeah, absolutely. I think part of what's making this transition to online only so disorienting for so many is that we don't actually have access to the physical places that used to house uh, workflow for a lot of people. Now, for Jen and I, because we've been one-to-one -one for quite a while, the transition actually wasn't so rough because we had our workflow sort of already digitized. But for so many colleagues who are used to being able to pull a particular graphic organizer out of a filing cabinet and going up and photocopying it to distribute to students, handing it out in class, collecting it in a stack, stamping it perhaps, grading it, and then returning it to students, Basically, 0% of that process is intact right now. So um, I think the, the best bit of advice I can offer is for teachers to actually sit down and think about the full workflow cycle and figure out where those particular tasks are going to take place digitally and how they're going to get them organized. So I think about, okay, you as a teacher, you're going to create a document or a graphic organizer handout, something. You're going to distribute it to students. Students are gonna do whatever they're gonna do with the document. Um, then you're gonna collect their work. You're gonna give feedback or somehow engage in student work and then return it. So each of those steps has to have some digital counterpoint now that we're away from our classrooms. So for me, um, I'm thinking about what are the tools that I have access to at school and how can I most effectively streamline this process so that I'm in as few spaces as possible. Um, my school has Schoology for our learning management system, and we have the Google for Education suite. So I have Google Drive is my main storehouse, and then Schoology is the main way that I'm 
distributing, collecting, returning. Um, so if I'm going to create something, I'm creating it in my Google Drive, which is convenient because I can share it very easily from Drive. Um, and if I'm asking students to type directly into a document, they can make a copy in their own Drive. Of course, schools that use Classroom, this whole making a copy and returning it is taken care of. Um, I'm distributing through my learning management system on Schoology. Students are, it's really important to be thinking about where students are gonna be doing the work. So um, back when we had physical classrooms and students in them, I would spend time at the beginning of every school year actually having them get their own infrastructure set up. So I'd create, I'd have them create folders in their Google Drive for each unit of um, our school year. And then I would tell them which folder things went into um, just to sort of help them learn digital organization. And I'd mirror those folders in um, for my kids that use iPad uh, in Notability so that they'd be able to ink on a PDF, for example, or do sketch notes and have those save in the same sort of hierarchy. Um, so think about how students are going to do the work, but then also um, once you collect it, how are you, the teacher, going to, in, going to engage with the work? So if it's a major project like what Jen's talking about, I know I'm going to want to give feedback via um, comments, for example, in um, docs. And I'm going to want to give lots of comments and probably throughout the process so that it's um, something that they can actually act on instead of a note that they get back at the end of the assignment being due. Um, if it's something where I'm looking for their engagement and I'm assessing their engagement, like, for example, in a discussion board, I might set that up so that I have a rubric built into my learning management system and I'm giving feedback via rubric. Um, so it's really important to think about how you plan to give feedback along the way so that you can set up the, um, the collection system appropriately. So if I want to give a rubric feedback on a discussion board, I need to make sure that I set the assignment as a discussion board instead of as students submitting individual comments. Um, and then the last piece is, you know, how I'm going to give things back. So if I'm giving it, if I'm giving my feedback through my learning management system, it's already taken care of. If I'm doing it through um, Google Docs, for example, then it's going to be a more individualized communication with students. But I think for every teacher, they need to think through what that whole process loop looks like in their class and where those things are going to take place and maybe what folders they need to set up so that they have the infrastructure ready. Um, for me, I have a folder in my, my Google Drive is organized into um, my teaching responsibilities and my teacher support responsibilities. In my teaching folder, I have, I have a folder for every course I teach. And in every course, I have a folder for every unit I teach. And then I, ha I house the documents and slides and forms that way. Um, I also have a folder for student work. So if students are sharing their work back with me, I have a place to put it. Um, and again, we don't use Classroom at my school, but if we did, that would be taken care of for me. Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that your book, Power Up, has really helpful chapters on feedback and assessment and also on communication and workflow where you lay out some of these options of how student work gets submitted, commented on, and, and turned back. Um, so it's, it's a really helpful resource. Jenna, I, I want to turn to you and talk about one of the concerns we have as in this rapid shift to distance learning about kids and families who may be left behind who don't have the technology uh, that the, the times seem to demand uh, and overall the, the issues of the digital divide. Are there any things schools can do to level the playing field or to make technology either more accessible or uh, to find ways around and supplement the technology with print-based strategies. I, I know that's a difficult challenge. Uh, have you seen any, any it's, good it's, strategies it's, emerging? It's hard. I mean, the equity of all of this is huge. The equity of the entire situation that we're facing globally is huge. Um, this will hopefully be that moment in time where schools and districts and cities realize that internet access is a utility, that it should be regulated like a utility, that 
Uh, every home should be wired for internet the same way it is wired for electricity and water service and all those basic things that are become basic human needs. Um, until we get to that point, until we realize that as a, as a society that we need that for every child uh, and every student, um, districts are, are filling in the gaps. They're surveying families to say, what do you need? What do you have? Uh, my district right now, as we speak, is passing out laptops. Um, the parents and kids drive into a high school parking lot and someone hands them a laptop and, and they, are, they go with that. Um, our local internet provider is providing free internet hookups, but the call time wait to get that done is, is you know, days or hours. So call back later, go to our website. I'm like, I'm calling you because I can't go to your website. <laughs> um, um, so, you know, we've, we've seen our, our students and our families try to rise to that. I'm, I'm spending most of last week, my co-teacher and I, checking on our kids, con trying to connect with them, trying to see what they need. Uh, emails to parents, do you have a laptop? Do you need a laptop? Here's where you can go to get a laptop. Um, do you need internet access? Do you need food? Do you need something else? You know, taking care of those Maslow's before blooms kind of things. Um, so we're doing everything we can to get technology into the hands of our kids in San Diego Unified. We've been one-to-one -one for seven or eight years. And fortunately in that time, we did do some projects where kids got um, 24 seven access, they got to take their device home with them. So my district has some experience with take home devices. Not every district does. A lot of them are coming up with plans just now. Um, the, as far as leveling the playing field, um, acknowledging that kids have a range of access. Even students who get internet access or have internet access may have that access through a lower bandwidth connection, especially in a lot of our rural areas. Expecting kids with a low bandwidth connection or limited data to be on a Zoom call is ridiculous. You can't do that. That's um, where my parents live. They get their internet through the satellite. They get 10 gigs a month. I could run through that in an hour at this point. <laughs> um, so uh, offering options where the student only needs to be online for a short period of time to get their assignments that they can then go do offline. Um, they can read a book offline. They can write an essay offline. Um, and then they just need to get back online to turn it in. The other option is things that do well with phones. So uh, Google Forms do really well with phones. They're very mobile friendly. So is Flipgrid is very mobile friendly for kids to do on a phone. Uh, so is uh, there's a wonderful app uh, called Quizzes. Uh, that allows kids to review content. And I'm gonna assign a quiz to my students tomorrow through that that they could do on their phones. And so things that are built for mobile first, uh, things that are meant to work well on mobile devices um, is also a great way of accessing kids who have more limited access. But you know, consider, do they have, do they have good internet or not? And if they don't, you're gonna, you're gonna respond differently. If they have no device or no internet access whatsoever, you're gonna respond very differently, of course. I think Diana has something to say about um, about some of that too, because you've you've had some thoughts about how to address things when when how you as a teacher structure things differently when kids have more or less access. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been thinking about sort of like a framework for approaching this challenge when students' access to internet is really variable, or even when their home life scenario makes it such that their access is really variable. Like we have students who are providing childcare for siblings during the day and just frankly can't get onto a scheduled class session. Um, we have to be accounting for those variables. So um, if you think about asynchronous teaching and learning and synchronous teaching and learning on a sliding scale, I think that's gonna be really helpful. So let's define those two terms and then I can kind of explain the framework. So asynchronous means that class interactions are happening without real-time interaction. Students are engaging in class material, they're completing their work at their own pace, typically within a given framework, like you're gonna to post to the discussion board by Wednesday and respond to a classmate by Friday, for example. Um, on the other hand, synchronous class interactions happen in real time at the same time. So this is the classic, students are attending class on Zoom or on Google Meets. Um, and you know most online classes, especially for schools that intended at some point to be an online school. Like I know I've taught online classes for USF and it's always a mix of synchronous and asynchronous. Um, so the question is, where do you move the sliding bar from synchronous to asynchronous? 
And what I like to think about is synchronous requires equitable access to devices and Wi-Fi. So as access to these resources becomes less reliable and students' home life makes it more difficult for them to participate in a particular time, the more the teacher should sort of slide the bar closer to asynchronous lessons and activities that students can complete on their own time schedule instead of on our time schedule. Um, so as access gets more finite, instruction has to become more flexible. You know, having synchronous classes is a privilege because it suggests that students all have more access, right? So thinking about how we move the bar from synchronous to asynchronous to be able to um, support student learning regardless of where they are in, in terms of access. Um, as we get into more synchronous lessons, so I mentioned this before, I teach at a school that's had one-to-one -one, um, since 2011, and we've, we've worked really hard to make sure that all of our families have access to Wi-Fi at home. And um, one of the challenges that we were worried about was that as we did Zoom lessons, that students might feel really uncomfortable if they started comparing home environments. We have a real range at our school. And um, we didn't want any of our students to feel like going to class was unsafe for them or just felt really exposing or too vulnerable. Um, so we've tried to create some norms, like in our, in our student handbook for going to school online, we asked them to um, set up their Zoom so that they had a blank wall behind them or a door behind them. So that there wasn't anything particularly interesting behind them. Um, and when that's not possible, we've encouraged students to use virtual backgrounds. Um, of course, that can get a little bit too tempting and too fun for students, but we've, we've been able to sort of um, keep it mostly for, for school purposes instead of having students trade like TV sitcom sets in their backgrounds. Uh, but I've actually seen teachers using the Zoom backgrounds as part of the lesson. So asking students to think about what, you know, now that you've read chapter six, I want you to think about what your background is going to be. And when you come into class, the check-in question in the chat is going to be for you to explain your background and why. Um, one of my colleagues teaches marine bio and this is an all senior class and they're totally heartbroken that they're ending the school year on Zoom. And they all had their backgrounds as scenes from Finding Nemo and other undersea adventures. And some kids showed up in, you know, scuba, like their snorkeling masks just as, for fun, right? So there's, there's ways that we can use the background um, as an equalizing effect and still have it be in, in favor of what's happening in the classroom. Um, I would like to go back to what Jen was saying, though, about the digital divide. Um, a good friend of mine works in foreign policy. And she's been saying that her new go-to phrase about the coronavirus crisis is that it's exacerbating existing inequalities. So the digital divide that we're talking about right now has existed long before we had to flip the switch to online learning. It's just that this moment is highlighting those inequities. Students have been dealing with limited Wi-Fi access and limited access to devices at home for a long time. It's just those differences are being laid bare right now. Um, there's a lot about this moment that, you know, we're asking classroom teachers to be mindful of finding the way, finding a way to create the most responsive, most equitable, most empowering education we can. And we're absolutely called to do that. But I think we also have to remember that there's a lot right now that's so far outside the control of a classroom teacher. And it's kind of unfair to expect that we're going to be able to solve bigger systemic problems with our you know, my sophomore English class, for example. Um, so I, I would just reiterate that what Jen said, that I'm really hoping that we learn from this crisis that high-speed high speed broadband internet access has to be a thing that we're providing going forward. We've got to wire up the nation. Um, I just have this image in my head that school districts are right now distributing Wi-Fi access points in much the same way that they're distributing meals to students facing food insecurity. And that like that image of making sure that students have the basic necessities to me suggests that access is required for us to be able to deliver on a 21st century education. I think throughout your answers today, you, there's a thread of connection and 
personalization and rapport between the teacher and the students. Uh, I'm wondering in this period where students are isolated from each other, are there things that teachers can do to build bridges between students for collaboration and engagement? Jen? I've actually been asked to speak on this exact topic uh, later today in a webinar uh, about student collaboration. So the I've been thinking a lot about it. Um, it. Of course, we would much rather have our students gathered together at a table talking about something over a piece of paper or analyzing a text together. Um, but there's also, I think, an opportunity here and something to be said for teaching them how to participate in threaded discussions online. Uh, most online college classes are going to expect that of them. Mm -hmm. And the, sorry, there's a little background noise in my house, but uh, most online classes are going to expect that of them when they get to college or even later in high school. So why not take this opportunity to teach them how to do that? Because they don't do it well. Just like we had to teach them how to have conversations in the classroom, we also have to teach them how to have conversations online. And this is our chance to do that. So um, they, they, can, they can learn to do that. We have some actually a really great discussion guide in, um, in Power Up, uh, guidelines for getting kids to do uh, good online discussions. I happen to know it's on page 193 because I had to look <laughs> it up for a thing I'm doing this week. Um, and so they can still collaborate in Google Docs just like they did in the classroom. They can host their own Zoom meeting or their own Google Hangout meet and record that and share it with the teacher. They don't have to have a teacher present every time they meet. Our kids are actually quite connected. Um, my own children have been in touch with their friends. They know what's going on in the world. And, and once they figured out that they could have Zoom meetings with their teachers, their next step was, well, because does that mean we could have Zoom meetings with our friends? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, of course you can. I'm like, now as a teacher, how can I leverage that to get them to do some schoolwork together, uh, to get them <laughs> to have some academic conversations together? So, so um, I don't see this as a time of less student collaboration. I see this as an opportunity to teach them the skills and tools that adults use to collaborate at a distance. Diana and I live in separate cities and we've been collaborating for years. Uh, you don't have to be in the same physical space as someone else to work with them. And I think that our students can learn that. And this is a great opportunity for them to learn that. Um, I think we'd actually be doing them a disservice if they graduated from high school without ever learning how to do online digital distance collaboration. So take it as an opportunity. You know, we're going to teach you how to do, how do adults work? How do people collaborate when things are not close together, right? You don't have to be in the same space to get a lot done. Right. right. The two of you wrote a book together for at a distance. <laughs> exactly. So exactly. exactly. There, there is proof. Yeah. Diana? Well, you know, I think about like in Power Up, we wrote about there's, you know, four different types of collaboration that we use to frame our chapter. We talked about collaborative preparation, collaborative production, collaborative feedback, and collaborative presentation. And I know I mentioned that um, part of my job allows me to pop in and out of colleagues' classes. And so let me just give you a few snapshots from this last week when I was popping into some really great classes. Um, so I joined a sophomore chemistry class that was on solubility and insolubility. And what I witnessed was that students were engaged in collaborative preparation. They'd been assigned a home lab and they had their, their laptop set up in their kitchens and they were trying to figure out the solubility of household staples like salt and baking soda and cinnamon and pepper. And they didn't all have to have all of those ingredients. It's like, hey, do you have any cinnamon? I can't, you know, they're communicating and collaborating in different spaces, but they were doing the preparation work before they went back and independently were writing their lab results. So collaborative preparation was still happening. It just looked different. Um, I also went into a freshman photography class and students were presenting drafts of an upcoming photo essay documenting life in the time of coronavirus. There were a lot of shelter in place photos looking longingly out a window. Uh, but in the session that I witnessed, classmate, classmates were offering critiques to one another, making connections, asking questions of each other in support of their revision process for the final draft. That's collaborative feedback. It's still happening, it just looks a bit different. Um, you also asked earlier about engagement. And again, I think engagement is still happening, it just looks a bit different. Um, we wrote about sort of three keys to engagement, curiosity, perplexity, and connection. And I would suggest that in this time of extreme disconnection, that we're finding greatest success with offering students opportunities to connect as a way of engagement. 
Um, my school recently just surveyed our students about their experiences with the first few weeks of online learning. And the number one thing that they asked for was more group work. I mentioned this before. They wanted more breakout rooms, more time to connect with their peers. I even saw one of our social science teachers um, brought in our state senator and had him doing a Q&A with students, and they loved the opportunity to connect with another human being via Zoom. So my advice would be to spend as much synchronous time as you can muster equitably um, with students engaging with one another. Um, I think about when I, I went to a large public university and we always had lecture and section. So lecture, you'd go and you'd listen to the professor talk about stuff. And then section was the smaller breakout group with you know, 20 of my peers instead of 400. And we would actually have a discussion and this is where we consolidate the learning. And, you know, I think of right now, if you're running a class that has some sort of hybrid of synchronous and asynchronous, that the asynchronous, the flipped lectures, for example, that would be where the, you have the professor lecture. That's where you're gonna have the teacher doing a screencast of his or her lesson. And then the synchronous opportunities are section. That's where we have students in conversation with one another, asking each other questions, working in smaller teams. And that doesn't have to be something that the teacher is managing, right? That can be something where we assign to students that they're going to go work in a small group and do a FaceTime together or do a small group Zoom like Jen's talking about trying to convince her students that they can work together. That's wonderful. Thank you both for uh, sharing your time and your insights. Uh... You've given us uh, a lot of good concrete ideas. Thanks again, and we, we look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank, Thank you Dan. so much. Our pleasure. Power Up, making the shift to one-to-one -to -one teaching and learning, and its free study guide is available at stenhouse.com. There's also a companion website, pluginpowerup.com, and we've posted chapter nine from Power Up to our site. I'll add all of these links to the description for this podcast. Check out Diana Neeby on Twitter at dneeby, D-N-E-E-B-E, -E -E, and her site, diananeeby.com. Jen Roberts' site is litandtech.com, and her Twitter handle is jenroberts1. That wraps up another episode of Teacher's Corner. Check out our website at stenhouse.com, where you can find podcast archives, book previews, study guides, and more. If you haven't done so already, we'd appreciate it if you can take one minute to give us a review at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever podcast player you use. It means a lot. If you've done so already, thank you. Please consider sharing this with a friend or colleague who you feel could get something from it. And as always, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Send your thoughts to us at marketing at stenhouse.com. Until next time, stay safe, sane, and healthy.